<laughs> we meet again, my young scientist, for what is science part two? Talking about the nature of matter. So, starting with the atoms, the smallest particles of elements that retain its character. So, its structure is going to be protons, neutrons, and electrons. This should be review, so take down what you need, leave what you don't. Nucleus contains the protons and neutrons. You will see me put them as P plus and N zero. Protons are positive, neutrons are neutral. Looking at our electrons, they are negatively charged. You'll see an E negative written down for them. They move around the nucleus in an electron cloud. Now, atoms themselves have no net charge because they contain equal numbers of protons positive and electrons negative. So equal numbers, you put them together, they should equal zero. So protons equals electrons. The atom, stable atoms, has a full outer electron shell or orbit. Now this outer shell will contain electrons. The inner one contains two, and then we go eight, 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 and continue. To be stable, it wants a full one. So if it does not have a full outer shell, such as this guy right here, it only has two, he will want to combine with someone else to become stable. This is the Bohr model, ladies and gentlemen. So, elements. Elements are a substance that cannot be broken down into simpler chemical substances, and every living and non-living thing is made up of elements every single thing and they are identified by a one to two letter symbol looking at the periodic table we have metals on our left we have non-metals on our right and in between we have metalloids which are a combo so looking at each box we have the atomic number up top which is the number of protons and since we have the exact number of protons and the exact number of electrons as protons, the atomic number can be the exact number of electrons or protons. Next we have the symbol, a one to two letter symbol, this is krypton. Then we have the atomic mass. The atomic mass is going to be the proton plus the neutron. So, you may ask, how do we get the neutron? Well, Tian here, neutrons is going to be the atomic mass minus the number of protons. There you go. Isotopes are an element of the same element but have a different number of neutrons. Still have the same chemical properties. Example is carbon-12 that has six neutrons. And then we have carbon-14 which has eight neutrons. Now these Two different isotopes break down at a very different time period. So, we can actually use them for medical purposes, radiation for cancer treatment, and we can also use them in aging objects. Carbon-14 dating is used to estimate um, how old something is by the rate of the carbon-14 breakdown. Now talking about chemical compounds. Ooh. A substance that is composed of two or more different elements that are chemically combined, such as water, H2O, two hydrogen, oxygen, combined, we have a compound. Now, chemical bonds, we've got ionic and covalent. We're going to start off with ionic. It's formed when one or more electrons are transferred from one atom to another. So, sodium chloride, salt. Sodium, Na, has one electron on its outer orbit. It is known, the electrons on the outer orbit are going to be valence electrons. So, it has one valence electron. Now, if you remember, it wants to have eight in its outer orbit. So, it's either going to have to gain seven or give away one. Easier to give away one. Well, chlorine has seven valence electrons, or seven on its outer shell. It's either going to have to give away seven or snag one. Easier to snag one. So sodium gives chloride, uh, chlorine an electron. And then we have an ionic bond. 
Now, what this creates, this gaining or losing of electrons, are going to be ions. Ions is an atom that has an overall charge. It has a charge of some point. So, if sodium is neutral right now with its one valence electron, and then it gives a negative away, if it gives a negative away, it's going to become more positive. So sodium becomes a positive ion, and chlorine gains an electron, which is negative. So it gains an extra negative. So it's going to be overall negative. So if you gain an electron, you're going to become negative. If you lose an electron, you're going to become positive. Am I positive? I'm positive. Covalent bonds. Chemical bonds formed when two or more atoms combine, sharing the electron. Sharing. Okay. You have a single, double, or triple bond, depending on how many electrons you're sharing. Here we have water. Water has six, or excuse me, sorry, oxygen has six valence electrons, so it needs two electrons. So we have hydrogen that has one, and it's going to share right here. And then we have another hydrogen that has one, and it's going to share right here. So now oxygen has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And each hydrogen has a full outer shell or outer orbit with two and two. Now, the molecule is held together by a covalent bond having no overall charge. Smallest unit of molecule. Small, uh, sorry, smallest unit of most molecules. So, it's going to be example is water, right here, H2O. Van der Waal forces are slight attractions that develop between oppositely charged regions of the molecules. Think of this as very weak force, it's a very weak force, but there are a lot of them. It's like Velcro. One thing of Velcro, one little hook of Velcro, isn't going to really hold. But when you stick all those hooks on, it creates a pretty strong bond. Same with the Van der Waal forces. And it's, uh, this is what allows a gecko to climb the vertical surfaces and hang off by one toe. Properties of water. Water is the most important inorganic compound made up of 70 to 90 percent of all organisms. It is a covalent molecule and it is polar, meaning that it has a positive and a negative side. It has covalent bonds that do not share electrons equally. It's an unequal distribution of charges. What that basically means is that the oxygen side over here has a whole bunch more electrons, which is going to make it more negative. Then over here, there's not many electrons. That's going to be a more positive side and a more positive side. So we've got a positive side and a negative side of water. Now what this typically does is it attracts other polar molecules. So negative attracts the positive side of water. So they're actually going to come and fit together. And they're going to be pretty strong because negative and positive attract each other. What does this do? The hydrogen bonds are a weak attraction between the hydrogen of one molecule and the oxygen of the other molecule in water. This polar, uh, water being polar, actually allows it to have cohesion, or an attraction between molecules of the same substance. Now, cohesion, you can remember that cohesion is of the same substance, for co is cooperation. If you're cooperating with somebody, you're cooperating with a person, the person, same substance. And this is like the drop of water forming beads on the surface. Or if you drop water onto a penny, it will bubble up. That is also surface tension. The ability of some organisms, uh, some insects, to walk across the water is due to its surface tension. Their pads do not actually break the surface tension, do not break the water molecules apart. Next, we have adhesion. Adhesion is the attraction between molecules of different substances. So add, you're adding a new substance. This gives us capillary action, or what we see in science with uh, our graduated cylinders are meniscus, which is the
the water grasping the glass on the edge, creating this dip. Next, we have other facts about water. It is resistant to temperature change. It is a good insulator. Extremely important to cellular function. It expands when freezing due to the crystal structure of the atoms are further apart. Okay, solutions of suspicion, suspension, excuse me. Mixtures of materials or compounds of two or more elements or compounds. Physically mixed but not chemically combined. The not is a big thing. So marbles, they're mixed but not chemically combined. Same here with all of our different nuts and seeds. So, when we talk about solutions, is a mixture in which one or more substances, the solutes, are dissolved evenly in another substance, the solvent, and usually will not settle out, such as Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid is the solute, and it dissolves into the water, which is the solvent. You can remember that the solute goes away, because at least I remember it this way. Solute sounds like solute. And soldiers salute when they're about to go off to war, when they're about to go away. So, the solute goes away. Water is known as the most universal solvent because it can actually break down a whole bunch of things. Suspension mixture of water and non-soluble mixtures. Particles in blood, Italian dressing, some of the sodas that have the little um, bits inside. Acid basis and pH. The pH scale measures is a measurement system that indicates concentration of hydrogen ion in a solution. 1 to 14, 7 decal. Below 7, the 6. Above 7 is basic or alkaline. Now I said it measures the concentration of hydrogen ions. Below 7 is more and more and more hydrogen ions. Above 7 is less and less and less hydrogen ions. So, acids, any substance that forms hydrogen ions in water. Acid solutions can contain a higher concentration of ions, but it's lower on the pH scale. Base is a substance that forms hydroxide ions in water. Basic or alkaline solutions contain a lower concentration of hydrogen ions, but it's higher on the pH day. Buffers prevent sudden changes in pH. So this is used a lot inside of our bodies to maintain homeostasis. And that's all I have for you today, folks. Have a good night.